in England. In England, and these these kinds of references to blackness happen over and over again. So, as I mentioned last night, um, Anthony Burgess was a very popular Puritan preacher, and he uses the uh, trope of blackness when he says original sin cleaves to us as blackness to the skin of an Ethiopian. Um, there are other ministers and preachers who are stressing that blackness is symbolizes sin and uses that as a metaphor to talk about the total depravity that is present in all human beings. Um, others um, then then begin to emphasize the fact that if all human beings are symbolized as Ethiopians and Ethiopians are symbolically understood as representing sin and evil, then the metaphor of washing becomes used in preaching over and over again. Uh, we must be washed whiter than snow in order to achieve salvation. Salvation is associated or juxtaposed with whiteness. One is not able to enter into the kingdom of God with black skin. So these are narratives and symbols that are being used over and over in English preaching in the 16th and 17th century. So if you were to walk in a typical English church or chapel in the 17th century, you might hear a sermon about the Ethiopian needing to be washed white in order to achieve salvation. I argue that the proliferation of this imagery began to reify in the Western consciousness, the notion of blackness as evil and sinful, and it transcends religion into the broader culture and the broader society of which we continue to wrestle with. So one of the, the, the results of this struggle are the, the, the negative impact that it would have on the lives of actual people of African descent. Narratives using symbols that denigrate Blackness and denigrate Africans would consciously and unconsciously lead to the negative treatment of actual Africans, real life Africans. And we know historically that by the 17th century, the English crown is beginning to involve itself more and more in the transatlantic slave trade in which Africans from West Africa and some even from Central Africa are being bartered and being transported and sold uh, into European um, communities in which they are then later being transport, transported into plantations to work as chattel slaves. And the, the notion of the inferiority of Africans, the notion of African subjugation, even the, the notion of African damnation uh, become ideas and ideology that is spread ironically through Christian preaching, English Christian preaching. And it's something that slave traders and slave owners would, would grab a hold of as justification for their utilization of Africans in the slave trade. So when we think about the image of the Black Madonna, that earlier image that was borrowed even from pre-Christian images of the Black goddess as the loving mother, the nurturer, uh, the symbol of the cosmos in which all of creation receives the light, the energy, the nourishment, uh, the fecundity, the, the, the empowerment that comes by being strengthened and loved and nurtured by the Black goddess, later understood as the Black Madonna. This later becomes corrupted in many ways with this notion of the inferiority of Blackness then transferred into the treatment of actual Africans in slavery and the debasement of slavery. So a perversion 
of this notion of the Black Madonna and the, the notion of the Black goddess and all her goodness is evident in this image, uh, the image of the enslaved African woman who is being forced to use her body as a source of nourishment, um, not only to her child, but also to the child of those who are enslaving her and debasing her and treating her like a commodity. Uh, and ironically, the recognition of the, the gift of life that her body is offering, um, the, nur the nutrients, um, um, the refreshing, uh, the reviving, the feeding that are, that's coming from her body, um, symbolizing the divinity of uh, the universe, symbolizing the feminine has been perverted into this um, overt uh, representation of oppression. And arguably these negative tropes associated with blackness um, stemming from European and English Puritan preaching has led to this oppressive condition. I mentioned yesterday that the mask of blackness was a performance that not only tells the story of the whitening of blackness and these, these daughters of Niger um, as characters in the story, but also in the actual performance of the story in the court of King James of England, um, the actual queen of England at the time, Queen Anne, and her ladies in waiting actually put on blackface and they performed the actual mask of blackness. They performed as the daughters of Niger. And so this, this really pivotal historical moment in which blackface is taking, is, is literally part of the, the, the life and the artistic um, theatrical culture of the court of King James, the same King James that we read in the King James Bible will reflect then a culture that would proliferate and continue not only in England, but also in America, as you know, this, this ridiculing of, of blackness, this caricature of blackness, then no longer viewed with, uh, in terms of the miraculous, in terms of the divine, in terms of the sacred as part of God's creation, but is now used as fodder for ridicule for condemnation, uh, for comedy, um, at the expense of people of African descent, and in a culture that continues to dehumanize and to ridicule and uh, subjugate. And, is, and these images are used in justification of the continued subjugation of people of African descent. Something we also see uh, is as American culture begins to borrow tropes that emerge out of the religious teaching of English Puritans is this continued theme of washing blackness or washing away blackness. This is uh, an early um, 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century advertisement for soap. And you see in the advertisement the, the black child is in the tub and um, the white child is bringing the soap to wash the child. And the soap is being lauded is so powerful that the soap can actually even wash the black child white. So only using the soap on the body and not the face, one is able to demonstrate the power of the soap by the washing. So uh, this trope of, of washing away blackness and blackness associated with dirt, with sin, with evil, then is something that is, is becoming even present, not just in religious culture or religious preaching, but it's being present in advertisement, is being present in uh, mainstream culture. And if you were to think that this is something that happened a while ago, that something that was uh, something that is, you know, back during the Jim Crow era, we see in this, in this 
advertisement. Um, a advertisement that was from another soap company, Dove Soap, uh, about two or three years ago, uh, we actually see a similar phenomenon in which uh, this was actually a television commercial in which a Black woman uh, wearing uh, clothing similar to her skin color uses Dove soap and the miraculous impact of the soap then leads to her washing um, and becoming, voila, presto, a white woman. This is very much, again, reflected in the preaching of the English evangelical culture that depicted salvation as a process in which a black skinned person or a dark skinned person becomes transformed by Christ into a white person. And the white person then signifies salvation. They also depicted heaven as a place where everyone is white because the sin of blackness would be washed away from all believers so that in glorification, uh, in, 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 the, in the beatitude of heaven, um, the beatific vision in which we are in the blessed state with Jesus, everyone is white. So this trope then is very powerful. Symbols and tropes and narratives have, have staying power. Even when we don't remember the actual historical context from which we emerge, they emerged, the symbolism remains. Finally, and in closing, the, the phenomenon of skin bleaching has been, become increasingly uh, an issue in the past few years. We've seen in countries all over the world, from Africa, Asia, the Philippines, the Caribbean, um, people utilizing various kinds of products, including um, soaps with these chemicals and um, creams and pills that can literally transform um, people from darkness to lightness. Um, in this case, the picture of the woman here, uh, the woman uh, was able to utilize creams and pills really almost to make herself look like a different person. And in fact, the story that was attached to this image uh, indicated that her own father did not recognize her um, once she had transformed herself. And she walked up to her father and he did not know who she was. Um, so the, the idea um, that one must become washed white, right, again, has literally passed down into um, the practices of people. Here's an image of Sammy Sosa, who was a famous baseball player. Um, from Cuba, I believe. Um, and he has transformed himself um, into almost a, just another person that you would not recognize. Uh, so this, this problem of, of, of wanting to become something other than one is not because of this legacy, the legacy of the need for washing. Thus you see the intersection of various themes. Through this legacy, a theological legacy, we see what was historically uh, the valoration of blackness, the recogni recognition of blackness as divine uh, has been misinterpreted, has been twisted, has been perverted by the application of white supremacy to biblical interpretation in English preaching, specifically leading not only to a religious culture of white supremacy, but then the transformation of these ideas and the proliferation of these ideas into mainstream culture so that not only institutions such as slavery are justified, but even after the, the institution of slavery is over in the West, you continue to have anti-Blackness as a major symbol and trope manifested in the society and affecting the lives of African people, of people of African descent, affecting the quality of their lives, affecting the way that they perceive themselves and affecting the way society continues to treat them. So something for us to, to ponder is, 
even if we look at individuals who are lightening their skin, for example, can we truly criticize them um, solely without recognizing that the society has contributed to them having this perception of themselves and also a society that privileges whiteness so that some individuals in Africa and in the Caribbean uh, embark on lightening their skin like this just so they can get a job just to better their chances to get accepted into a school or some, some institution. That the privilege associated with light skin, even in countries where the majority of people are dark skin, is such a, a phenomenon that sometimes doing something that to many of us may seem extreme may actually be an act uh, for that, that's literally leading for people to think about their quality of life and even at a bare minimum survival. So I would leave us with thoughts on why does the Black Madonna weep? The Black Madonna weeps when her children suffer, particularly her Black skin children. She weeps when her children are profiled harassed and murdered unjustly, simply for the color of their skin. Why does the Black Madonna weep? She weeps when her children are subjugated as inferior for any reason, but in today's society, for belonging simply to a group that has the, the luminosity of darkness in their skin and, and the beauty of darkness, the divinity of darkness, those who are reflecting the image of darkness that is present in God, these people are treated and subjugated through institutions, through all of the levels of systemic racism that affect her children. Why does the Black Madonna weep? The Black Madonna weeps when her beautiful Black children do not believe that their Blackness is beautiful. She weeps when her beautiful Black children condemn themselves, have internalized self-hatred, internalized denigration, and she weeps when Black people oppress other Black people for the beauty of their own Blackness. What must we do when our mother weeps? What must we do to wipe the tears of our Black mother? Why does the Black mother weep and will the Black Madonna continue to weep? This I submit to us for our reflection. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can submit those in the chat at this time pertaining to this part of the lecture about why the Black Madonna weeps. Um, and Dr. Lewis will attempt to answer those and then she will move on to the second part of her presentation. Uh, at this time, I do not see any questions in the chat. We'll give it a few seconds. And Dr. Lewis, there are no questions in the chat at this time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And actually, there may be some thoughts or reflections as I move into the second part of the lecture. Um, and I'm pulling that up right now. Your insight is appreciated and all are very pleased and feel that your lecture was powerful and, and just extremely educational. You are much appreciated this morning for what you have shared. Thank you so much. So hopefully that what we will have an opportunity and I know we only have 30 minutes left. So um, I, I simply have some words um, with regard to American Methodism and many 
ways. These, um, this is an extension of many of the, these ideas and reflections about race, um, but it's, it's, it's really moving into the area of Methodism specifically. So um, I will um, begin and um, this should not, this will not last longer than um, 10 or 15 minutes. So hopefully we'll have time for some conversation. 18th and 19th century white American Methodist adopted the philosophical notion of race as ontology in theology and evangelical preaching, leading to the diminishment of the political and socioeconomic flourishing of African Americans in church and society. This thesis can be demonstrated based on an historical evaluation of the life and times of Harry Hoosier, an 18th century African American Methodist preacher. Hoosier in many ways straddled the black and white Methodism of his day. Unlike Richard Allen and other black Methodist ministers of the what would become the later AME church and AME Zion churches, Harry Hoosier chose to stay within the white Methodist Episcopal church. And he was forced to endure assaults on his humanity along with his failed quest to become an ordained Methodist minister. Hoosier's story encapsulates the triumphs and defeats inherent in the American Methodist story on race. Although Hoosier has been championed by Methodists, black and white alike, as a success story reflecting racial harmony and cooperation, I argue that the reality is his quality of life was significantly diminished uh, by inadvertently internalizing the ethic of white supremacy inherent in Methodist evangelical preaching. Methodist leaders, including Francis Asbury, with whom Hoosier traveled the circuits as a preacher, refused to ordain him. Hoosier's gifts and graces were utilized and taken advantage of by white Methodist leaders in order to, to further the missionary imperative and the building of the church. Yet Hoosier was denigrated and even openly criticized by many of those same white leaders who complained that he was, quote, full of himself. Eventually, Hoosier had a nervous breakdown and lapsed into alcoholism. This is part of his story that Methodist history tends to ignore. We don't hear this part of Hoosier's story. I argue there is a correlation between the theology of white Methodist evangelicalism that Hoosier was exposed to and in many ways embraced in his preaching and ministry and black nihilism or despair evident in his later life. What is white Methodist evangelicalism of the, the 18th and 19th centuries? Based on John Wesley's treatises, sermons, journal writings, and other sources, it's evident that John Wesley early in his life had an amb ambiguity or had a sense of ambiguity toward ambivalence towards race and slavery. This is reflected in his relationship with enslaved Africans, both in South Carolina and England, as well as his continuing friendships with slave owners like George Whitfield and Nathaniel Gilbert. For example, George Whitfield, also the very famous Methodist evangelical preacher, was an unapologetic supporter of slavery. Whitfield petitioned the Georgia Board of Trustees to accept slavery in the colony. Whitfield eventually purchased enslaved Africans to work on the Georgia plantation of a boys' school, and then later bequeathing the property and the persons held in bondage as assets in his will after his death. Yet there is no evidence that John Wesley, who regularly 
uh, corresponded with, with George Whitfield over issues of theology and doctrine such as predestination. No evidence that Wesley challenged Whitfield on his, his promotion of slavery, his, his theological affirmation of slavery, and his actual ownership of slaves. Secondly, Nathaniel Gilbert was an English plantation owner who brought enslaved Africans from his plantation in Antigua to England with him. And during one of those trips, John Wesley actually baptized those enslaved Africans. Wesley talks about this in his journal, but he does not give any evidence that at any time did he challenge the fact that these Africans that he baptized were held in bondage. John's relative ignorance of, of the slavery issue was not remedied until some 25 years later, until he corresponded with the abolitionist Quaker, Anthony Benizet. This corresponded correspondence led to John Wesley's breakthrough in awareness about the reality of the slave trade and the, the horrific conditions of slavery, making him come out publicly uh, with an anti-slavery stance and an abolitionist in his 1778 publication of Thoughts Upon Slavery. In this tract, John Wesley goes on to denounce European philosophical ideas sanctioning race as ontology, which was the underlying ideology justifying the enslavement of Africans. And not only re rejecting and criticizing philosophical notions of racial inferiority championed by philosophers such as John Locke and David Hume, Wesley also implicitly critiques the evangelical religious stances taken by later Methodist and other Christian leaders. However, John Wesley's theological and philosophical stance against racism and against slavery would not be echoed in mainstream American Methodist theology and evangelical preaching. Instead, white Methodists overwhelmingly ref reflected the philosophical notions of race as inferior and projected that in their preaching and ministry. Despite practical attempts to oppose slavery and segregation among some early Methodists, such as Francis Asbury, for example, white Methodist leaders generally did not foster the theological legacy of, of John that struck at the ideological root of race as ontological difference. Now, what is race as ontological difference? Race as ontological difference is part of the enlightenment philosophical teaching or, or reflection that there is a significant essential difference in ethnic groups according to nature. For example, many enlightenment thinkers in the period questioned the idea that people of African descent were fully human. They acknowledged that Africans were above on the scale, so to speak, of lesser creatures such as animals, such as apes or gorillas or monkeys. But they argued that African persons were still beneath in terms of the great chains of being Europeans or even other ethnic groups such as Indians or Asians. Many of these enlightenment thinkers would even claim that people of African descent did not have souls. 
Later, this would be taken up by 19th century African American writers, philosophers, and theologians who would emphasize the fact that, that Africans did have souls. And this becomes part of the cultural trope that would pass down even into the 20th century. The emphasis, the emphasis on soul culture or or, or the souls of Black folk is as in reflected in the title of W.E.B. Du Bois famous track, or the fact that Black people to this day, when they talk about having soul, it, it goes back to the questioning of Enlightenment writers of whether Africans were truly human. So the, the notion of race as an ontology is steeped in this idea that, that people have, people of different ethnicities have a different nature or, or different essence. As we've seen, John Wesley rejected this idea, but white Methodist overwhelmingly did not. In their biblical interpretation, in their theological reasoning, many white Methodists justified race ontology. And this then became the ongoing justification to support racial discrimination. This was not only evident in the writing of meth white Methodists who supported slavery. One can imagine that slave supporters or pro-slavery Methodists of which there was a huge contingent reflected in the division of the country at the time of the Civil War, white pro-slavery Methodists would surely think of race as ontology as a substantive um, difference among ethnic groups. But even among white abolitionist Methodists, there's evidence in their writing that there is an inherent difference between white and black people, for example. And that even though slavery was unjustified in their thinking, and they used their own interpretation of the biblical narrative uh, to reject slavery, they still reflect in their teaching a belief in ontology of the ontology of race. Therefore, I submit to us in this conversation that race as ontology as prevalent, prevalent in white evangelical preaching of 18th and 19th century white Methodists still has a reflection in to some degree in modern preaching and theology. Um, it is evident in much of the culture of mainstream white evangelicalism today. But my question for all of us is bringing it back to the life of Harry Hoosier and the way that this, this thinking of race of anthology became subsumed in his own understanding of God and salvation. Are we as African Americans unwittingly transmitting internalized notions of white supremacy in our own ministries? in our own evangelical preaching, in our own biblical assumptions and interpretations? Are we examining, are we ex um, ex um, analyzing the, the ways that we are understanding and propagating underlying assumptions of cultural and racial difference in the way that we read, think, and preach the Bible. I'm hoping that we will be able to have a robust question, um, que question and answer period around this issue. Because as you know, one of the main issues today among Black theologians is criticizing the influence and impact on white evangelical preaching on Black churches and Black preachers and theology. So with that, so we'll have some time. It's almost, it's, I have 1042 Eastern Standard Time. So I'm going to stop and see if there are any reflections or feedback, um, even if there aren't any questions, if there are any comments. Um, some may take 
my statements to be controversial. So I would be interested in hearing if there's any feedback or even any disagreement with regard to these claims I've made. And you don't have to worry about being polite. I see some people typing in their squares, so I'll give it a couple seconds. There might be some questions coming through on the chat. Some may have not have heard the story about Harry Hoosier and his nervous breakdown. If anyone has a question that maybe you feel is too complicated to put in the chat or you're not sure how to phrase it, um, if you raise your hand, um, use your reaction button to raise your hand, I think uh, Mr. Everett will be able to unmute you and you can ask your question aloud if that's easier for you instead of typing a wordy question. Let's see, I have one in the chat and then uh, Ms. Sharon Robinson has also raised her hand. Uh, the question, let's see, in the chat from Ms. Paula McCullough, she says, this has been an excellent lecture series. Race ontology is new to me. Can you speak on it? I think she's looking for a, a stronger definition or a clearer definition of that. Absolutely, absolutely. Race ontology is simply the notion that there is a essential difference, um, at least in our immediate context, between the Black and white racists. So what emerges in the Enlightenment period, and arguably the claim I make in my book, is that what begins in the 16th, 17th century theological discourse, which posits the, uh, the images and symbolisms of blackness as evil and whiteness as good, um, this, uh, this idea of a, a notion that there is a a fundamental distinction between people that have phenotypical difference. So phenotypically white, phenotypically black. And then what emerges then in outside of the religious context into the secular arena is the development among philosophers that there is a biological um, or essential or natural difference among people of different ethnic groups. So that, that it, it isn't simply just physical um, uh, or, or phenotypical difference in terms of just skin color, superficial, but there is an essential, there is a natural difference uh, among um, different groups. Um, Enlightenment philosophers, um, some of them um, were, were scientists, uh, or attempted to be scientists, they actually would create a hierarchy of human life in which most of them, of course, would put Europeans on the top and then other ethnic groups in descending order. And it wasn't just for a class division of society, but they believed that there was an essential nature um, ascribed to these different groups. So that's all that race ontology means. Um, the idea that there what later would be termed a biological difference. Um, that's uh, one way that we could think about it. But whether you're thinking about biology in terms of an actual science, or just that there's an inherent difference between black and white people, as well as other ethnic groups. Does that help? I think Ms. Paula did find that satisfactory. Okay. And then we have a question from Ms. Sharon Robinson. Paula is agreeing, yes, that was satisfactory for her. Uh, Ms. Sharon Robinson is unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, in the news uh, lately or recently, there have been a lot of things going on about um, banning certain books in schools. And most of it has to do with um, race, uh, like the color purple, um, 
Catcher in the Rye, um, Beloved by Toni Morrison, The Hate You Give, uh, just an example of some of the books that they're wanting to ban. Um, what is, I mean, they're saying it, it's, it's a, a conservative movement, but that to me seems racist. And uh, so what are we to do with that? Because if they're, they're trying to get it out of education, and this is the only way that, that um, our children are going to be successful learners is through education and the books and everything. So it's like they're trying to take away uh, our, our, our uh, uh, connection. Uh, I might not have said it correctly, oh, but uh, no, I that, was, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. I, um, I think that is an excellent question. I think that what is going on with the banning of books is uh, something you've seen throughout history and you've actually seen throughout church history. Um, but I think that it goes back to this notion, particularly the banning of African-American books, these really um, core text uh, in our uh, our genre that of literature in particular that have such an impact on the formative development of African American minds, um, but all minds. I think this is um, a, a, a really a continuation of this legacy of erasing blackness. What you're seeing is the fear in, in um, many circles that I believe that are attached to white mainstream evangelicalism fear of the confrontation that, um, that takes place in which blacks and whites or people from these traditions sit down and have honest questions and honest conversations about our history. And the fear is having to face that history, having to be honest about the reality of um, our cultural and historical legacies that have been steeped in racism, steeped in oppression, and steeped in anti-Blackness. So it's a form of denial. It's a form of erasure. It's a form of um, a fear of, of being accountable to the past. And it's also a fear of of having those types of conversations that will lead to the eradic eradication of the white privilege in which many in these evangelical positions and these also in these governmental positions have. They, they see a destabilizing of their position in society. And they see the transformation in the minds of populations of young people uh, who are wrestling with texts like these core texts, who are having questions about race, who are interrogating um, the systems of oppression. And so those in power um, are doing what those in power have tended to do historically is, um, you know, muzzle, muzzle, you know, the horse, you know, you know, shut the gates, stop the conversation and stop access or um, hinder access to the materials that would foster growth, healing and transformation. Thank you very much. All right. <clears throat> Dr. Lewis, we have a question in the chat from Ms. Kim Troy Richardson. Uh, she is asking, what are some examples of how white evangelical Methodism is currently affecting African-American preachers in the black church? What larger impact does this have on the black church? Excellent question, very excellent question. Thank you so much. That is a great question because um, some, so I'm seeing different things in white evangelical Methodism. Um, as you know, one of the things that's taking place in the United Methodist Church is a major split, and um, there's already been a schism that is moving um, to create an entirely new denomination. Um, if There are a lot of things going into that, but one aspect of this group is, I think, reflected in, in some of the earlier um, thoughts that we've had about banning, is a kind of denial about our past and about our history. So the, the, ref, the refusal to engage uh, current events um, around racism, the, the 
on the ground reality, life experiences of people enduring systemic racism and oppression and how it affects um, the lives of ordinary Americans, the refusal in white evangelical preaching to even acknowledge this, to even confront it, to talk about it, you know, to face it, um, but to uh, pretend as if these things simply do not exist, that it does not um, inhabit, it's not something that inhabits their orbit. It's not something that they're concerned about. And when pressed, they would deny, they deny, they would deny racism exists. They would deny that these kinds of oppressions exist and in their preaching and in the way that they engage the text, they're reading even the Bible from a position of privilege um, in which they are positioning themselves in the, in the text and they are not seeing the context of their brothers and their sisters and those who may not have the same privilege as, as they are. And I think this is one of the problems and one of the downfalls of uh, white evangelical preaching historically is that it tends to erase the others. Um, it, it, it tends to ignore the lives and the sufferings of others and therefore treats them as if their, their reality uh, is, doesn't, doesn't matter, Black lives matter. It, it, it treats them as if these people do not matter. And, and if God, it, 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 it assumes that God is not listening to the voices of people um, who are on the margins, because these are preachers who are, are preaching and speaking and teaching in the name of God. So the message is that God privileges some groups over others. And I think this is, is what is most problematic about white evangelical preaching is that it, it privileges whiteness in the mouth of God. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lewis, we have one more question in the chat, and then we want to allow time for um, President Lattimore uh, to give any closing remarks or final questions as well. Um, the question in the chat is from Paula McCullough. She says, do you think that destroying of images led by the Puritans was a way of concealing the truth of Blackness, knowing that if the history of Blackness was destroyed, that Blacks would forget their value of Blackness and the value of the Black family? Reverend Paula, that, that's my thesis in a nutshell. You got it. I think that's exactly right. I think that the Puritans uh, um, and the Protestants and their engagement with the destroying of images of um, the Black Madonna and, and all the ways that they worked um, to not only conceal Blackness, but then to demonize Blackness and then continue to do that. So they created a legacy, right? So they did it in a particular period, beginning in the 16th century, and then it created a legacy that has passed down. So the ongoing concealment of blackness, the ongoing erasure of blackness, then leads to African-Americans not knowing our own value, our own history, our own traditions. And in that sense, white supremacy can destroy us from within. So that I think that's an excellent question. Dr. Lattimore, the floor is yours. If you have any closing remarks you would like to give. Well, thank you, Dr. Lewis. This has been a, a refreshing um, baptism of, of, uh, of knowledge and affirmation of culture. Uh, we take great pride in, in having you uh, as our lecturer uh, for this series in the tradition of Bishop James Walker Hood, who was not only an, an educator, but an advocate, an agitator, and a proponent of both knowledge and transforming wisdom, which, uh, which we take pride in as a, a seminary. So you have uh, continued that fine tradition and you've um, embodied, you've embodied what you've talked about and you've illustrated it profoundly. And we are deeply appreciative of your contribution. Um, in addition to sending you something tangible 
I will also send you a cloth which, um, um, which uh, has the um, marquee of the, of the seminary on it. And uh, I always say to the speakers, it is, it is designed to wipe tears from your eyes. It is designed to uh, wipe sweat from your brow. It is designed to be a cloth to remind you of your journey with us. So God bless you as you continue to be a proponent of deep wisdom and deep care and deep love for not only our culture, but for a society that can be better yeah. when they acknowledge the darkness that exists within us. And, uh, and we take great pride in what you have shared. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, President. That was wonderful. Thank you. And thank right. you again for having me. Absolutely. Dr. Grant, are you, uh, was that, was that it? These are the quote, my words were the closing that, remarks. That is, that, that is, that is not it because the journey continues. Yes. And so we yes. thank you, Dr. Uh, Tamara, for giving us manna. Thank you. Uh, from heaven for the journey. We feel like we can run on a little bit further and yes. see what the end is going to be. So God bless you. We will God be in touch. You. And I thank you for all you have deposited in us. Uh, this weekend. Thank you so much, Dr. Grant. Thank you so much for inviting me. And we will be in touch. I will be in touch with you shortly. All right. So All thank right. you so much. Blessings. Have a wonderful, wonderful. Oh, I I I wanted to see if um the um the remaining relative I see of uh, Mrs. White and Bishop White. Did oh, you want to yes. have some <laughs> concluding remarks? You were here last night. We've got about 30 we, seconds. We acknowledge the, one of the benefactors, yourself. the benefactors of, of, of this great event. Please share a word. You're on mute. It, it is always a joy for me to be on to share with you a blessing, a dynamic uh, presentation. I did to all of the words and from the participants and all to just share this moment with you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Lewis. And uh, I pray that we will continue, as you say, march on with the manner that has been deposited into our spirits today. Always a joy to remember uh, the memory of, of my parents, Bishop and uh, Mrs. Alfred White, as well as to remember um, your wife, uh, Dr. Lattimore and Dr. Amer, and all of the others that have impacted our journey, even the, the Madonnas that have impacted our journey along the way. Blessings to each of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Amen. 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 Peace. Peace and blessings. Thank you. God bless everyone. Be safe.